one descends on all of us to get that last little bit of culture in before you're locked in your houses under snow or whatever. My name's Antonia, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the library, and this is the first official program in our Pathways of Peru, which is the theme for our Wintertide Read and Ramble this year. For those of you who uh, don't know what it is, um, we do over the uh, eight weeks, eight and a half this time, uh, we challenge people to either walk or read or do both, a certain number of miles, a certain number of books, uh, using a journey, a pilgrimage, some kind of path uh, as an inspiration. And uh, we, it's a tiny fundraiser, so you uh, sign up for it, and then um, all the programs are free, so anybody can come to those, whether they sign up or not, but the people who have signed up get a raffle ticket. And at the end, we have a prize for the first person to reach the final destination, a prize for the first, a prize for the first reader, the first walker, and then we have a raffle drawing, and the last program is a big feast where we try and make foods from the region. Um, we did the I Did Arrive two years, and Kathy uh, Turdies, who will be speaking today, shared her experiences in Alaska. And because she's been everywhere, we tapped her again to do Peru. Um, if anybody is interested who hasn't signed up in signing up, but you still have plenty of time, I have packets here for people who have signed up. Oh yeah, you get this really awesome magnet clip. Here. It's worth it. Um, and uh, for those of you who have signed up, please don't forget to get your raffle ticket at the end of this talk. And I would like to present our board treasurer, Kathy Spurdies, who, as I said, has been everywhere and always gets things so she can share the uh, cultural artifacts as well as her experiences. And she's going to talk to you today about two different trips to Peru over the span of like 30 37, years. 37 years. So please enjoy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is supposed to be kind of just a fireside chat sharing, you know. So just a little bit about me. I grew up in North Carolina. Um, I, I, did, I was a big reader, so I read about far off land. So I did not go to even outside of North America till my third year in college. And I went over for spring break and loved it so much that I went back to be an au pair in Paris for a year. So I, so, so that, those were my, so that was 75, 76. And you know, those of us who are old enough remember you just didn't hop on a plane every day like we do now. I mean, travel just wasn't quite as common. So I um, went to Europe and then I started working for an accounting firm. And luckily with that accounting firm, you know, accounting work is cyclical. You have year end and so we staff accountants were really busy. Je December, January, February, March, but after that we got not so busy. We were busy in June, July, and August, and then not so busy. So they didn't want to pay us to sit in the office. So they had a little arrangement that our first two weeks of overtime got paid out at time and a half. So we got three weeks off in addition to our two weeks regular vacation. So for several years there, I was getting five weeks off, and they were encouraging us to go. So I took advantage of that. So Peru, I went in 1981, um, and that was my third continent to go to. I'd been to Europe, I'd been to North America, of course, so I went to Peru. Now my first, so I'm calling this trip Peru Transposed, because I went in 81, 81, and 18, 1, 8. And I'm an accountant, so we think we're transpositions. <laughs> so when I went to Peru the in 81, we started in Lima, then we went to, then we went down here to Arequipa, we went to Lake Titicaca, and we ended up in Cusco, where we went up to Machu Picchu there. So that was, it was a three-week trip. That was my time and a half overtime. <laughs> um, so this was a picture that I took in 1981 of the main square, Plaza de Armas. or Armas. I don't speak Spanish, I'm afraid, but. Here, I would, it says El Peru, and I believe it says 81 there. So, you know, it's interesting to, so just to, so now, that's a recent picture. I did not take that, but that's the same church right there is now in this bigger picture right there. And so now, I'm going to, here's a comparison. 
so you can, I mean, see, you know, these white buildings here are pretty um, visible, but not now. They're there. They're there, but you just, and look at all, I mean, they're just building up. There was no buildings, you can tell. Uh, I mean, I don't, this pic, my picture, because here's El Peru, and there's El Peru. You can see more to the right, but you can see that was not covered in houses back in 81. So that was fascinating just to find these two pictures, find my own picture and then find mm -hmm. a, um, I wish I'd known I was gonna want a picture current day of that, but. Um, so, I thought that was interesting. It's grown a lot as is every place. People are coming, like here, people are coming out of the rural area still into the village, into the cities. So, our first stop in 1981 was, after Lima, was Coca Canyon. Now, Coca Canyon, as one of the world's deepest canyons. It's 10,000 feet deep. And one of the things that's native to Coca Canyon and we came to see was the Andean condor. And I'm sure that's what that guy's about to throw, some kind of stone, I think, to rustle up some condors. And we did see them, but I didn't get a picture of them. So, um, and then another thing, we flew over with these Nazca lines. Um, they're, write what they were down. I wonder where I wrote that down. I didn't bring that piece of paper. Oh, wow. Well. Those are pre-Incan. I forget. And those were, are trenches in the ground. And they are, I mean, I forget. I thought I read they were 400 AD that those were done. But um, I forgot to write my little note down. But that was another one of the highlights we saw in 1981. And we also went to Lake Titicaca. <coughs> this is a slide that has been digitized, so the coloring from 37 years ago, but Lake Titicaca is the highest navigable lake in the world. It's at 12,507 feet. And one of the famous things from there, from their Taquillo Island, or Tequili, is their waistbands. And this I got in 1981, and all the men wear them for sure, and even some of the women wear these. And so what I read online is the weavings from this Taquillo Island are amongst the best in Peru and possibly even the world. So this really is, I mean, it's 37 years old now and love, they're just lovely. Um, what, what do you mean by the wavings? Weavings. The weavings. Oh, the weavings. weavings. Oh, okay. Is that my southern accent? That <laughs> <laughs> um, now this, I'm showing you this one. This was, we stayed in this little stone hut. We stayed, we slept, we slept on stone beds. And um, this was Barbara. Barbara, I was from North Carolina, I was from Virginia. Barbara was from Boston. And I even came up to visit Barbara in 1982, my first trip ever to Boston. We wrote for a couple years afterwards, but lost track of each other. And when I got back from my, 19, my 2018 Peru trip, she, I found her online, and we've gotten together a couple times. So how neat, 37 years later, we, we have been able to reconnect. She lives up in Lexington. Well, there's me in 1981. Um, amazing how my hair color has changed over the years. I guess that many more years of sun has lightened it. <laughs> I don't know what ruin that is, but... Um, and this was Machu Picchu. That means, so I went in 1981. Um, you know, Machu Picchu was one of the hidden villages of the Incas. We, what, I'm, this is a couple different pictures, but that's the classic shot from above. That's from a little bit further back. And that's the road up to Machu Picchu that the buses take. Um, and I think that's the only pictures I have of that. So what we did, so I did not hike the Inca Trail, the four-day Inca Trail, but we, they, our, I remember our guide, who was British, Andreas, he, we got off at, on the train, we got off at milepost something, where we were immediately met with guns. Um, I mean, we stepped off the train and uh, guns surrounded us, and he talked us. He talked his way out, out of whatever we were in trouble for, and we were able to walk. And so we walked like the last four miles of the Inca Trail 
up the hill and then we came over from this view um but i and then we took the bus down and that was kind of harrowing to get taken that bus down what, what did they think you were part um, of the shining path gorillas pardon did they think you were part of the shining path gorillas no they didn't but you know we one of the things when we were in lima we were told that peru was in the world cup for soccer and our trip would be measure, immeasurably better in Peru for the next three weeks if they won. And I think they did win. I don't know what that would have been the, the consequences if they, we hadn't won. Um, so, and here's a couple, this is one of my favorite pictures that I took. That little girl, what, what do you think, say she is four? So she's now in her 40s, early 40s. Wouldn't I have loved to somehow get that on the internet and say, was this you? And, and meet her nowadays. But I actually have the 8 by 10 that I've had hanging up in my house off and on since then. Um, I included this picture because it shows a little bit of a street scene in 1981. But it also, this, this really spoke to me because I lived up in Estes. I lived up in Alaska. I lived up in two Eskimo villages. And that was from 94 until... 2003. Now, I, I came to Alaska with a four-month-old daughter, so I was in the children milieu as such, but I, even in Alaska in the 90s, these dark-skinned children did not have dolls that looked like them. Mm -hmm. They had blonde, blue-eyed dolls, mm -hmm. you know, so to come back upon this picture, which I hadn't seen for years because they were in slides, and our own Francis, our own librarian, Francis Bauschman, digitized all these photos for me, which I appreciate. But I mean, I, I really think of that now, and I think of that's 37 years ago, and how many dolls looked like the children that held them. That was just a group of children out on the street that I just love the picture of. Okay, so that's, that's kind of it with 80, my, my 1981 trip, I think. I do have some, I, I do have some things that I bought there. These are retablos, and they're typically um, high, nice folk craft, and they've got doors, and they open up to either a religious scene or a religious and an everyday scene. So please come up and look at those. I showed you the chumpa, the waistband, but, and this was... Um, this was just on a bench when we ate lunch somewhere. And where we were, we were out in the country somewhere. But the thing I remember is the smell of burning eucalyptus trees. It doesn't smell like our eucalyptus that we use for, you know, um, cough and cold relief. But it had the most beautiful smell. And, I, it, and so that was permeated with that smell. So for about a year, I could go smell that <laughs> that blanket and still be transported right back to the uh, burning of eucalyptus. Um, any questions about 1981? Did, did you did you hear any tales about the uh, Shining Path Road? You know, I don't recall. But okay. I mean, definitely there was a lot of military presence back there in '81. I mean, we saw a lot more soldiers with guns roaming around. This past trip, um, I, Shining Path was not where we were. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in the in the, in the, um, the tourist area. I mean, because, you know, this is the area of the Sacred Valley. That's where most people go to. And so, you know, they're, they're going to be much more Vigilant. determined to not let Shining Path or any other terrorist type um, activities go on when their bread and butter is tourism and that in the Cusco um, Sacred Valley area. Do you, so, do you see, did you see many musicians who play that pipe? You know, thank you for bringing that up. In 1981, they were everywhere. I don't think I saw, I don't think I saw but maybe one. I mean, I remember being in restaurants and a musician would come through with the, with the pipes in 81, but not for this, in 2018, no. I didn't see that at all. Mm, you have to go to hey. Harvard Square. <laughs> Pardon? You have to go to Harvard Square. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> They've all immigrated. Um, you said there are religious things. What is there? Um, the religion is mostly Catholic. Uh, 
But what now, and I wish I could remember exactly what, so another difference between 81 and 18, our guide was British in 81. Our guides were native. They were Quechua. They were Incan mm -hmm. descendants, which I thought was just wonderful. That And they could talk about their lives. And, they, and it was interesting because our first guide was named Frank, and he talked about marriage and how he got married, and it wasn't quite with the church. I mean, it was more of the old tradition. I forget, maybe, and, and I can't, I can't, re, you know, remember what he'd said to me. But and because a church wedding is very expensive, he said. So you know, in most cultures that the Catholic Church or any church has moved into, they have tried to eradicate the old beliefs and the old customs. And I was real surprised that that they were living some of the old customs in Peru regarding at least marriage were living alongside the Catholic traditions. Well, I had heard, too, that they could um, communicate telepathically. They could visit people. Like, there's still some that are sort of kind of not understood. I mean, Laura, I'll be honest. Do they have tribes like that? Yeah, so I don't know. You know, now we had, I don't think I put any pictures. I thought I did, but now that I, because I had to transfer pictures from my slot, you know, my picture folder over to the PowerPoint that I'm doing. We did have a shaman ceremony where he put all this stuff together like an embryo from an out from a llama and all this weird stuff and so they still do sh but that might have been a tourist thing you know <laughs> but um that was kind of interesting we were in kind of a out in the out in the countryside in a cave doing that so i mean they had the definitely had the um setting right so this was my last trip when i went now so what I did on this trip, so here's Cusco, and here's Machu Picchu, and this is the area somewhat in between Cusco and Machu Picchu. And we did a, so the main part of this hike was a trek. So we started, so, so Machu Picchu's way off the map here, but we started around here, and we went up here, went over a 15,000 foot path, and pass, and then we went up to Lars Hot Springs, and then we hiked along here and then came down, I think, that. So that was, that's what the main part of this trip was. Well, there were seven of us on this 2018 trip. The travel agent's a woman in Connecticut. So we were all from Connecticut or um, Massachusetts, actually. And um, we, on the trek, though, hiked two days, and then four of the people broke off and went to Machu Picchu. I'd been to Machu Picchu, and so had two of the others, so we kept on trekking. So you'll, we'll get to that. So there's the bigger picture. So I know we can't, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I know we camped here at Kunakani. Here's where we went to the hot springs, and here's the pass. I'm sure we came over to come back down. Um, so, um, Here's one of the pictures of the terraces. Now, terraces were very important. They actually, when I did a little research about terraces, wait a minute, I have to interrupt myself before we get to that. So when I came home from my first trip to Peru, I had some new enlightenment. One was, how are these people in Peru? And I didn't meet that many Peruvians, but they were scratching out a life, trying to get, I mean, a potato, a, a regular size potato is about 100 calories. So if you want 2,000 calories for your day, that's 20 potatoes. So 20 potatoes, I know they don't eat just potatoes, but 20 potatoes times 365 is a lot of farming. Mm -hmm. you know. And here I was worried back in Roanoke, Virginia, where are my seasonal symphony tickets going to be? You know, That was my biggest concern at the time. And, um, and there's, he, you know, I just came home thinking about these Peruvians trying to scratch out a living out of their earth. So that was one of my enlightenments. Another one was a number of the other people on the trip had read quite a few of the South American artists, not artists, writers, novelists. I had not, so I had to come home and catch up with um, a number. That was a fun time afterwards. So now I've tried to always, in my subsequent trips, read a few a novelists, a few writers before I go on the trip. Okay, so back to could, you. Could you recommend? Pardon? Who, who's your favorite? Well, Mark, I can't, Gabrielle Marquez, what's his name? Garcia Marquez. Pardon? 
Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Yes, 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 he was the main one. But the Peruvian, and we're we're going to be doing a um, a book discussion is Mario Vargas Llosa. So we're doing a discussion on the storyteller, and there's some copies available. Oh, okay. Already. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to read that. So, um, but this is just the typical terraces that were so common in Peru. Of course, they needed to make do with the hillsides in order to make their um, to grow their crops when they were living up in the hills. Here's a ladder that they would have used, that in this case could be used to get from, those are pretty high terraces. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, they, and they did have to move between them and rather than walk all the way to the end. Um, mm -hmm. So, this is my notes here. <coughs> so, <clears throat> in addition to developing the terraces with the rock walls, they also had highly developed irrigation systems. Um, and those were developed by the W-A-R-I culture in about 1,000 A.D., preceding the Inca. The, the Inca tradition was from about, the height of the Inca tradition was about 1300 until 1600, and that's when the Spanish came and, so, of so course, wrecked. On that note, uh, did you find much of a tension between the indigenous people and people of Spanish de descent? I did not see that, but I wouldn't have seen that. That may be more prevalent in Lima, you know, where the power, the, you know, I mean, Cusco is, is the capital of the Inca world. And so I, I might not, that probably was somewhat hidden from me, but I'm sure that's more prevalent in, in the ruling area of the country that, you know, in, in um, um, Lima. Um, so. But I love these terraces. This looks like an older terrace, and what you're seeing here, these are their ladders, their steps to get between the terraces, and there's some right close up. That's what they would have um, gone up and down. And that picture was from 81. The other two were from my last trip. So the next section of these pictures is our hiking. Um, our, uh, when we were out on the trail. We hiked about eight miles a day, <coughs> up really high elevations. <laughs> I can tell you, you know, I, I'm looking at these pictures and thinking, wow, was that pretty. What I recall was this, step, step, step. <sighs> you know, I wasn't always looking up, so I'm glad I took some pictures so I can remember how pretty the views were. Now, this was a saleswoman following us. She was going to wait until we took a break, and then she did, and she opened up those baskets and put out her wares for us to buy because um, they are pretty, um, well, just like any salesperson. And they're, she's they're, climbing up there with a the child on her yeah, back. Yes, <laughs> I know. They're pretty tenacious. So um, this, these are just some of the pictures we, we passed a lot of ruins. Um, we had animals carry our packs, which was nice. And we even had an empty donkey they called the rescue donkey. So if any of us needed to ride the rescue donkey, the donkey was available. I was the weakest hiker, so the rescue donkey carried my pack most of the time. And our packs were just our day packs, and we were carrying no... Um, no major, um, you know, camping equipment or anything. This is me. It does look like I'm holding on for dear life there <laughs> going down those hills. But, I mean, I just, and, you know, these trails are just the old trails, you know, going, and they walk on every, I mean, the locals walk them, yes. Except they take care of their feet. They must take care of their feet. I'm trying to think of what I saw the, the, you know, our um, mule wranglers and our, you know, wear, because they were the more local. Our guides came out of Cusco. They were wearing more, I mean, they were wearing our clothes, but the mule wranglers, you'll see, I've got a picture. This was one of our guides, uh, one of our native, um, I mean, you know, local guides on the right. I forget her name, but um, there I am. Here's one of our guides, Aldo. So I now have 
Facebook friends on six of the seven continents, and Aldo is my one South American Facebook friend. And we do write every so often, which has kind of been nice. Um, that's our whole group. Um, we had a mother-daughter um, team. They came from Russia. They immigrated from Russia when she was about nine. She's in finishing up med school now. Um, and so that's mother-daughter, and this is a father-son. He's my dulcimer teacher. Some of you would have heard him play right here in the library when he played with me once. Um, and um, this was, and so, that was our group. Here's some of the donkeys carrying our sleeping bags and pack, I mean, our kits and things. I love this picture um, of us hiking into the mountains of the gods. This was one of our guides, and this is you know, just one of the abandoned areas. I guess they came down to live in the village, in the city too. One of the things that we did is we bought food in Cusco before we went on our trek, and like here's bread we bought and oranges, because that's what we gave to the kids that came out and met us on the, um, the trail. But we kind of griped those of us that bought apples and oranges because those were heavy and we had to carry them on our back because that we didn't know when we were going to see kids. So we didn't want them wrapped up and tied onto our, our you know, our larger packs that were in the, with the donkeys. It was pretty cold. You could tell these kids don't have a whole lot of footwear on. They, they're pretty open sandals and it's obviously cold enough that we're in, um, and we're hiking, so we're going to even be wearing a few less clothes than we would have been if we'd standing still. So, um, um, I, could, I, I could, this, I just love that picture, how we were above the clouds in the middle. I couldn't get the one behind it off of there, but, to, but I thought that was kind of a cool fact. So if I ever need to know that I can do that again, I'll know how to do it. This was at a 15,000 foot pass. Um, now I have to say that, I, I was just talking to Mary Lee Halpin, our president, you know, the president of the trustees, and she went to Machu Picchu six years ago, and she was saying, you know, she's, when you continue, you know, when I went in 81, there was, there was no regulation. Now you have to have a ticket beforehand, you have a time to go to Machu Picchu, I mean, it's real, and they're starting to even limit it more. So Mary Lee wanted me to tell you guys, go now, you know, before you, they really limit the tourism. But one of the things she said is when they walked, you know how I took those pictures from up above Machu Picchu? She said they took the bus up to Machu Picchu and then walked to that place. But she said everybody up there was on their cell phone. You know, and I thought, well, shoot, that was me, 15,000 feet high, and I was on my cell phone because I finally got a, I finally got a signal, you know, up at 15,000 feet high. So, um, so I felt a little guilty that I, you know, that's the first thing I did was get a, check my email. Um, so, look at our guy talking about their feet. I mean, he has sandals on. He has some kind of sandals on. Now, I you know, a lot of sandals in, 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 in these poor countries are made out of tires or made out of rubber, you know. So I, I can't tell if that's what those are, but there's our question. They take care of their feet, but, um, and they also give their feet quite a pounding. So, so is just, most transportation by foot there, or is there a, a lot, lot of it's by foot? A lot of people are still doing walking, between, you know, because we were, you know, we were outside of the main, we, and we were really in the countryside as such. I, um, but I love this forest picture, different um, climate of, of any other that we went through. Now that's one tired puppy, that's me. <laughs> and I kind of look like I fell asleep mid-bike, because I got a piece of bread in my hand. <laughs> But um, I was tired. It was a lot of hiking, and I wasn't, I wasn't quite um, as buff as I would have liked to have been. <laughs> so th this is my one picture of the hot springs. Um, now, hot springs to me are, again, back to the Arctic. They're hot springs near where I used to live in, in the Arctic. And um, that was the only hot bath a lot of the natives of Eskimos got. And same thing with people here. They could, you know, I'm sure a hot
hot springs were a mecca to go to because they weren't spending their precious energy boiling too much water just to take a bath or to, to immerse themselves in it. I'm sure they never did unless they came to a hot spring. So I really do think of these as wonderful sacred pl places um, of previous generations. And that was next to the hot springs. I just love that picture. But you know, you look at something like that and go, ah, would I go on that bridge? <laughs> system here, a very good irrigation system, and built the design of these, I believe this, according to the design, depth, and orientation to the sun, there is a difference of 27 degrees Fahrenheit between the top and the bottom. And that's, I mean, it shows you that it's not that deep, you know, but these were all little microclimes that today scientists are looking at different uh, crops that can be grown. So it's, it's sort of been an agricultural thing where they would have grown their crops. Yes, in yes, in yes. And I read that, um, that, that these rock walls, of course, that's what made the terracing, but they also drew in the sun's warmth during the day and released the sun's warmth at night, and then the plants didn't freeze like they might have if they had not had that heating system. Isn't that, that grass that they're growing? Pardon? That's grass now. And that's a tourist site now, oh, okay. um, for the most part. Um, and here's one they're still working on. I mean, you know, they, they probably found these after some years, because the Spanish came in the 1600s and started disrupting the, the culture. So some of these, and like this one, like the one we just saw has been rebuilt or refurbished, but this has not yet. You can even see some of the walls are gone. 
and these are piles of original bricks that they've got or stones they've gathered up and they're going to be rebuilding this with you know some of the stones that were just lying around this is where we chewed coca leaves for the first time that was not a pleasant experience they were dry and they were yucky but and i didn't get high so um this area is are is called salinas de maras and these are these were first created in the 1400s by the incas and this is like a community garden you know i've had a plot community garden over at meeting house farm but and, and local people and you have to be local in the community can rent these and what happens here is the salt water from a hot a stream in the earth mixes with some other water and it flows in and because of these little walls here they can wait till it fills up and then they let it evaporate and they have salt that's the um, totality of it and they said so if you're new into the community you can have one of these but you're going to be at the far end and I guess you move up <laughs> or maybe you're on the edge you know, and you're new and you can move up to safer ground where does the salt come from the salt comes from in the ground it comes from a salt driven salt driven stream coming from the ground let's see what I wrote it says salt is harvested by evaporation a natural stream feeds a salt rich stream so the, the, the plots are you know dammed up and uh, you know and some you can see have more salt showing than others so they're they, and they have you know so they're it's all in a different phase of harvest mm -hmm. there are some people harvesting salt you can see them with their they're you know they're gonna be carrying it up there and it's set and they and they can do pretty well I mean I think I read um, in, the, in the next section I'm going to talk about that the kind of the average salary is about thirty dollars a month um, so people can do quite well selling you know if they willing to have something like one of these little community salt gardens this was last April yeah okay the next little section it's about guinea 